Hey there, everyone, and welcome to The Final Bar. Happy Monday. It's April 15th, and I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny and beautiful Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close, especially recently as we went through spring break last week. Personally, I've got a little spring break cold I'm working through after getting back, so we're doing this one from home, but appreciate you hanging with us as we uh, attempt to, to do our best to cover these markets and what all is happening Quite a bit of distribution as I'm reviewing the charts uh, coming back from spring break and looking at all the uh, uh, the uh, analysis over time. A lot of breadth conditions rotating from fairly constructive to fairly negative. So we're going to do a special segment today called Banking on Breadth, where we'll dig into some of my favorite breadth indicators, talk about some of the rotation that we've observed from bullish to bearish. What sort of warning signs may still be out there as rates go higher, as growth stocks lead the way lower, and as the market feels like it's on precarious footing at best. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap and look at how the uh, charts evolve today. I do want to start with a poll. We asked you recently, which of the Fab Four, and that is in big time air quotes, because I'm not a huge fan of that phrase, but we'll go with it for now. Which of the Fab Four stocks would you feel most comfortable shorting here? NVIDIA, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon. Now, these are the sort of four stocks within the former Magnificent Seven that were still doing quite well up through uh, last week, right? The names that are still making new all-time highs while the Teslas and Apples are retracing quite a bit. These are some of the names that are actually still holding up quite well. 58% of you said NVIDIA, 22% Meta, 14% Amazon, Microsoft with 7%. Let's go right to the chart of NVIDIA, which was the top vocator. I'm actually surprised uh, that uh, NVIDIA was the top uh, response, although to be honest with you, all four of these charts actually look fairly constructed. What's interesting is all of these, for the most part, right, are above their 50-day moving average, but those 50-day moving averages are very much in play. So when I think about which of those names, you know, what I feel most comfortable shorting, I would probably be looking to see which one of them starts to show the most vulnerability, right? Which one is breaking below recent swing lows? Which one is actually pushing below its 50-day moving average? NVIDIA is down about 2.5% today, but still holding above an ascending 50-day moving average. The RSI is holding around 50 uh, as well. Let's keep going with some of these other names in here. Microsoft actually just closed below its 50-day moving average today here on Monday the 15th for the first time since uh, October, right off of the uh, September low uh, of last year for Microsoft. Meta was second in its uh, in its uh, in responses, and that was around 2.3% lower today. But again, still above an ascending 50-day moving average. Amazon arguably probably the best position of all of these in that if you didn't know the market was correcting and you look at the chart of Amazon, you probably wouldn't get a sense of it from here, right? We continue to be in a nice uptrend of uh, higher highs and uh, and higher lows. I'd probably go Microsoft only because it's the first one to break its 50-day, but I don't know how comfortable I'd feel shorting anything at this particular moment, although I do get the argument, right? I mean, it's more of a tactical short than anything. I would be I would be nervous about making sort of a long-term negative play given the uh, the structure that is still positive, but no denying that we're in a uh, distributive pattern here. Let's go back to the dashboard and see how things played out today. A lot of distribution, of course, over the weekend, we had uh, you know news of escalation of the situation in the Middle East. And, and you know, it's funny, that's one of the, not funny, but that's one of those things we talked about as one of those potential catalysts for further downside uh, earlier this year, you know, where we talked about looking forward to 2024 and, and some sort of broader escalation in the Middle East, maybe involving the United States, could certainly start to weigh on economic conditions. We've arguably seen limited impact uh, of that uh, of the uh, of the uh, the challenges in uh, in Israel and Gaza and uh, and everything, but uh, you know now you're certainly seeing an escalation with Iran involved, and uh, and again not to get into geopolitical discussion, but certainly you're seeing some uncertainty because that's all it uh, it suggests is instability, uncertainty. That's when the VIX spikes. That's when stocks go down. That is exactly the situation we find ourselves in here. By the way, the S and P closed just barely above that line in the sand, fifty fifty. We'll look at the daily chart of the S and P here in a minute, but do want to point out that we were really close to breaking below that. Uh, we didn't quite get there. We closed around fifty sixty two. That's still down one point two percent from Friday's close. And now, how we opened higher today uh, compared to Friday's close, but then through the course of the day, just accelerating to the downside and really. Uh, you know, it's one of those, uh, it's like a football game where you just need to get to halftime. We sort of needed that break here with the market sort of in a, uh, a bit of a free fall there. The NASDAQ composite 
finished the day down 1.8%, mid caps and small caps all down as well. But the uh, NASDAQ, the worst performer out of those four major indexes that we just mentioned. The VIX, by the way, moving higher by almost two full points. So the end of the day on Friday, it's uh, just over 17. We finished the day today just over 19. So we are certainly seeing a um, you know continued increase in volatility. I don't like to call the VIX the fear gauge. I prefer the uncertainty gauge. I think that's a more representative of what the data is actually telling you. But however you want to describe it, uh, volatility is increasing. And that usually means uh, there's some concerning stuff happening underneath the hood here. Looking at the interest rate environment, we can see the 10-year uh, yield finishing the day around 463, the long bond yield around 474, the five-year point around 465. The short end of the curve, of course, is still pretty high. Um, so we have bond prices coming down today, the TLT down about 1.6%, pretty much the entire curve from mid to long end uh, moving higher. So we're seeing higher rates, and this is uh, you know essentially a reaction to what we learned over the weekend uh, and uh, the prospect, uh, I think, with Friday's inflation data as well, sort of adding to that uh, that uh, fire of negativity, if you will, um, suggesting or implying that the Fed may not have as many rate cuts or maybe delaying a little bit past the June meeting. Uh, that's certainly something I've heard discussed with uh, with my peers around the industry. And so, for now, rates going uh, rates going the wrong direction. I think if you're uh, if you're bullish here. Looking at commodities, uh, the DBC actually finished slightly higher, but it's been most of the day in the red. Gold and silver, uh, also copper prices actually did just fine today. It was sort of the energy side of things that was a little weaker. The uh, precious metals and uh, industrial metals actually did uh, quite well. We've talked about the uh, you know impressive run in gold and gold stocks, sort of a choppy environment here recently, but just like stocks selling off through the course of the day today, gold actually gently uh, increasing through the course of the day today. So sort of a uh, uh, flip that one over. Finally, looking at cryptocurrencies, all 10 in the red here. We do have Bitcoin halving coming up uh, later this week. We have Adrian Zadunchik of the Burb Nest joining us, I think, tomorrow on the show. Um, so we'll be able to ask him a little bit more about the Bitcoin halving. So if that phrase that I've uttered a number of times here recently, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, make sure you tune in tomorrow because uh, we have uh, one of the experts that will be able to tell us what it actually represents and how we should think about it. But long story short, it tends to be a it's a structural change in Bitcoin that only happens after a certain amount of uh, Bitcoin are mined. We are now at that point. If you look back in the history of Bitcoin, it is always 100 percent of the time ended up uh, leading to higher Bitcoin prices uh, because it just implies that uh, that there's uh, been progress in uh, in the evolution of the coin. Um, we'll, uh, we'll talk to Adrian tomorrow and get more details on that. But for now, Bitcoin currently around 63,500, really sold off through the course of the day uh, today. We have a little glitch with the data yesterday. I know our data team's aware of that uh, intraday data for, uh, for Bitcoin over the weekend that they're uh, working on cleaning up here. Looking at the 11 S&P sectors, you can see healthcare, Consumer staples, materials, uh, top to bottom, those are at the the uh, the top of the board. None of the 11 S&P sectors finished in the green. Healthcare was down about a quarter of a percent, followed by staples and materials down about half a percent. Uh, financials as well. And, you know, when you think about potential upside catalysts, right, what are the things that we could hear or see that could sort of, uh, you know, put a finger in the dike of this uh, of this sell off that we're experiencing here? One of those would be earnings uh, surprise to the upside. And we are just sort of in the midst of a bunch of banks reporting earnings. That's what sort of started at the end of last week. We're continuing that with a lot of regional banks coming up through the course of this week. And then earnings season really continues with a lot of other stocks and sectors represented over the next uh, the next week or two. But Financials really not providing that upside momentum you might want. We'll talk about Schwab as an example if we have time here in our market recap. Something trading higher, but then closing lower through the course of the day, making a bit of a shooting star kind of candle. Technology is your worst performer today, down 1.9%, followed by real estate, down one8 and consumer discretionary, down one7 Do want to point out the Keller market model, my market trend model that I uh, use often with my uh, market misbehavior premium members. As of uh, Friday's close, which was when I formally updated, the short-term model on all of the stock uh, uh, ETFs that I, that I uh, run it on, so large caps, mid caps, small caps, and the NASDAQ, all negative in the short term. For me, that tells me we're in a pullback. Uh, and then I look for the medium term model to turn negative to tell me we're in a full correction. I really need to get out of the way of a uh, a market in full uh, in full sell off mode. For now, it's sort of that early warning uh, that is absolutely uh, fired. Looking at the Magnificent Seven and Friends, you will see that there's quite a bit 
of red on this uh, particular chart here. We have Amazon, your best performer out of this group of, uh, of mega cap growth stocks, still down 1.4%. After that, it gets uh, pretty bad with Tesla leading the way lower, down 5.6%. I've had a number of questions here recently on Tesla and whether you know we're at a buyable point, which I won't obviously answer that question directly, but you know, days like this show you that a stock making lower lows and lower highs is not the type of chart that I'm attracted to. Tesla currently testing support, uh, time permitting. We'll look at that chart here in a few moments as well. Let's go to a daily chart of the uh, S&P 500. As a reminder, we're going to do a segment uh, a little later in today's show called Banking on Breadth. So we're going to dig a little bit more into breadth indicators uh, a little later. So I'll, I'll uh, skip some of that here in our market recap, but we will get to it. The S&P closed below its 50-day moving average today, and that's the first time it's done so since the beginning of November. So really since the October low, which is a pretty significant low, that's almost six months ago now uh, to, uh, to the day. You can see from there, we've been above an upward sloping moving average, 50 day moving average for most of that. Today, we close below it. That's after Friday trading down to uh, that level. And I know writing a, a note for my subscribers over the weekend, we talked about why that 50 day moving average is so important, why the 50 50 level, this pink line in the sand, is also uh, pretty, uh, pretty vital. Today, we literally traded almost exactly down to that line in the sand. And that's the level I'm paying attention to uh, to this week. The, the main question on my mind this week, does 50-50 hold? And if so, this could be a market stabilizing. That scenario would involve stocks like Meta and Microsoft, maybe NVIDIA, semiconductors like the SMH, uh, which is a semiconductor ETF. Those kind of things would have to hold their 50-day moving averages, uh, I would say, to hold the market up uh, above this uh, of this level. If we finish the week below 50-50, boy, all the breadth conditions probably got a lot worse. Those leaning names probably have started to really struggle. And there's not much left, I would imagine, at that point uh, looking particularly strong. So as of today's close, 50-50 is literally uh, on the uh, we're on the doorstep there. The RSI did finish slightly below 40. That's usually my cutoff for bullish readings, right? An RSI above 40 is kind of classic for a bull market phase. When you see the RSI start to break below 40, the last time we saw that, by the way, after the July market peak and the sell-off that started in August of last year, which more and more, I would say the current market is starting to look a lot more like that. Um, we started to break below 40, and that told you that this bullish phase from sort of the uh, midsummer period was starting to uh, revert lower. And you could see the lower highs and lower lows, but the momentum clearly getting more of a bearish range. That's the danger for the chart of the S&P 500 uh, right about now. I do want to show you the VIX. Uh, the latest video I did on my own YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior dealt with uh, the VIX and uh, and elevated volatility. Um, so check that out if you if you miss it. But we talked about some of the key levels on the VIX. A VIX below 15 is a low volatility bull market phase. A VIX above 2850 is a huge disaster scenario where you probably want to be defensive or uh, off in a cabin somewhere, not thinking about the markets. That leaves us with these uh, other levels, and I would say 20 has often been sort of my back of the envelope correction um, sort of threshold. A VIX above 20 all of a sudden puts us into a high volatility environment as opposed to a low volatility environment. We've been below 20, except for this little hiccup at the October low of last year. We've been, you know, for the most part below uh, 20 since the spring of 2023. So getting above 20 immediately has me starting to look for bottoming conditions, uh, which is what we saw in October of last year, right after the October low, we started to break higher, started to see signs of accumulation. We saw breadth indicators that were very negative, but then all of a sudden started to turn positive. But VIX below, uh, above 20, that is, uh, tells me high volatility, high uncertainty, really start to put on my bear market hat and think about how to manage potential much further drawdowns. And it's interesting that the VIX is close to getting above 20 very early in the sell-off, right? If you look here, we had the sell-off in August, a further drop in September, and then the final October low before we got above a VIX of 20. We're actually getting near 20 already. We actually just started to roll over. A couple of weeks ago, we we're talking about new all-time highs for the S&P uh, and the NASDAQ. So I think the VIX could be one of the most important charts here in uh, April to, uh, to continue to monitor. Just to finish off looking at some individual names, talked about Tesla. And again, my, my quick answer with Tesla is... Nope, I'm not ready. And and for me, stocks that are making lower lows and lower highs and are below a downward sloping 50 day moving average, I learned a long time ago, you just wait it out and you wait for signs of accumulation. So there is an argument to be made for buying weakness. And if you're a bottom fisher sort of buying, you know, the falling knife, buy at the lows and try to uh, anticipate a turn. 
I could see the argument for buying Tesla down at the March and April low, early April lows, kind of right down there, right around 160. Um, just below that, you have the April low of last year, which is down around 153, 155, we'll call it. So we're kind of right around that range. But uh, And we also have a bullish momentum divergence, right, with the uh, market making, uh, Tesla making new lows on higher momentum, which is overall not too negative. But for me, I'd much rather see signs of accumulation. I would like to see the stock stop making new lows, which it has, and start to make new swing highs. So for me, uh, Tesla above 181, which will get us above the 50-day and get us above the March swing high, that's when a chart like this starts to look interesting. Until then, I see a chart going down, and those are the charts that I want to avoid. I see the momentum uh, fairly negative with the RSI pretty much consistently below 50 all through this calendar year. I'd wait for that to improve, and I'd wait for the relative strength to uh, turn higher. None of those things have really happened uh, just yet on the chart of Tesla. Um, let's we uh, we talked about Microsoft and, and all those. I just want to remind you, Microsoft closing, uh, you know, really right at its 50 day moving average. So when you have a stock like this that has been in an uptrend for so long and you start to show initial signs of weakness, the question is, do we find buyers coming in? Are, are investors buying on the dips, which is what you saw here in January when we tested the 50 day? It's what we saw here in early March when we tested the 50 day and we are testing the 50 day yet again. A market rollover, right? A, a bearish phase is more like July, August, where you don't see buyers come in and that buy on the dip crowd is not around. That usually means we're, uh, we're, we're buckling up for more of a protracted decline. So I'd keep an eye on Microsoft uh, this week uh, as well. I do want to point out something like Charles Schwab, right? I think the bullish scenario from here has to be, I would say, in some way, probably um, uh, driven by earnings, right? I mean, in terms of potentially positive catalyst, you have economic data, of course, we could think about. I mean, and it's not a lot this week. It's not a heavy earnings week, but, you know, certainly some things to pay attention to with jobs numbers and uh, housing starts. Uh, but I would look for our earnings, right? And, and Schwab and other financial stocks are the ones that are reporting here. If you look at the candle chart of Schwab, it's not particularly encouraging because what happened today was we opened down here around 7050. We traded all the way above 7350 to make a new swing high, but by the close, we're actually right below this congestion area. So I see this as more of a stock testing resistance and failing to get above there. That's more of a distributive candle. You probably label it a uh, shooting star candle, but it's certainly not bullish. Um, the other thing I would point out would be something like uh, First Solar, right? Names like this that have recently broken out now rolling over a little bit, right? In a bullish scenario, breakouts work and breakouts are encouraging because additional buyers are willing to come in. You're seeing people sell this breakout because they're thrilled to take profits on a stock that's actually been up here recently. So again, a lot of the signs as we wrap the market recap, I would say more distributive than encouraging. We're going to talk about breadth conditions in a little bit. It doesn't make the picture look any better as a, as a little preview, but before we get to the charts of uh, breadth indicators, a couple quick announcements here. First off, uh, welcome your uh, feedback on our show. Uh, we've made a lot of changes here to Stock Charts TV. We're evolving the channel here in 2024. We certainly appreciate all the feedback that you've given us. Keep it coming. If there's anything you'd like to see more of or less of, let us know. But we would very much appreciate your questions. We'll do a mailbag show later in this week, and we'd love to answer one of your questions here on The Final Bar. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on X at Final Bar SCTV and on YouTube. Just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. And we'll hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag show. Also, to let you know, I will be speaking at the Money Show Investment Masters Symposium. We did one of these in Las Vegas uh, last fall. It was a lot of fun. I mean, it was a smaller group, really engaging, really interactive, a lot of fun. And I'll be doing a similar sort of setup uh, here coming up on May 7th through 9th in Silicon Valley. It's going to be right by the airport. So I hope you can join me there in person. We'll do a what workshop, I think, on day one. And then later in the uh, event, uh, three-day event, we'll be doing a two-hour masterclass called Seven Questions to Ask Before Every Trade. You can scan the QR code on your screen to sign up for that event. Uh, you can also click on the link in our description. I uh, hope to see you there. And if you do show up at that Money Show uh, Symposium in May 7th through 9th in Silicon Valley, do say hello. Always a pleasure to meet uh, viewers and uh, hear where they're coming from and where they're at and how we can uh, make this show a little more valuable to you. Let's continue on with our next segment called Banking on Breadth, uh, Breadth Conditions. To summarize here as a quick preview, They've not gotten better. They've actually, uh, to the contrary, gotten a lot worse. And it's just been in the last couple of weeks. I think when you think about what a market top traditionally looks like, and I actually recently did a webcast called um, you know, the Market Top Checklist, and we had seven items. And item number two, I believe, maybe I'm, I'm 
I'm, I'm going to fudge these a little bit. One of them is a deterioration in breath conditions. I think it's actually a breath indicators don't confirm a new high. And if you look at the advanced decline data, and to be clear, these uh, lines are not yet updated for today's close. These are current as of last Friday. But given the distribution we saw today, I would say pretty much 100% sure that all four of these will finish today below their 50-day moving average. What that means is I will start color coding these first three, which have been bullish green for quite some time because they have broken to new swing highs. They've been above an upward sloping 50-day moving average. Looks like all four of these are going to be below their 50-day moving average. Uh, for some of these, the first time since uh, November, right? Mid-November, I think one of the great sort of bull confirmations coming out of that October low where all these advanced decline lines just ripping higher, breaking above the 50-day, kind of pushing upwards. All of a sudden, you see them in a nice uptrend, making new highs and, and higher lows. That's all starting to change a little bit. You're seeing uh, these advanced decline lines break below their March lows uh, and break below the 50-day moving average. So I would say as of tomorrow, probably color code all of those more neutral orange and the small cap breath probably getting uh, even worse here. The McClellan oscillator turned negative uh, at the beginning of April and has remained below the zero line uh, for quite some time. Now, we've talked about this indicator. This is what I would describe it as a tactical breadth indicator. It's really more of a short-term indicator of breadth conditions. Uh, and uh, overall, negative McClellan oscillator readings have not been particularly painful for stocks. If you look in January and in February and mid-March, these uh, red shaded areas, you can see that the market overall was moving higher, whether or not the McClellan oscillator was above or below zero. Now, to uh, as a counterpoint to that, through most of 2023, the McClellan Oscillator was, I mean, spot on, right? I mean, the green patterns were, green sections were uh, fairly strong. The red sections were fairly red because the breadth conditions really mirrored, I think, the strength and weakness in the market. You've seen a market go higher, even though the short-term breadth at time has been very negative. And that's because those mega cap names have done so well. Now that you're starting to see weakness in names like Microsoft and NVIDIA and others, the weaker breadth conditions are really driving the market higher. And you can see how this red shaded area looks a lot more like the very effective signals that we received back in 2023. This has sort of encouraged me to pay a little more attention to the McClellan Oscillator for now, uh, pretty negative. And again, the 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 uh, all clear on this would be the McClellan Oscillator above zero. We'd have to have an impressive reversion higher for breadth uh, to, uh, to show uh, that sort of bullish reading right about now. Bull markets have an expansion in uh, new highs, and that's all the green that you see really through the end of March, maybe mid uh, early April, uh, where you see a lot of green and not a lot of red. And that's the bottom two panels here. These are the new highs and new lows on the New York Stock Exchange, new highs and new lows on the S&P 500. I'm using 52-week highs and lows, pretty standard um, uh, in the markets to, uh, to measure stock showing strength, severe strength and severe weakness, I guess. If you look at the last week and, and really the last month, look at how the new highs have gotten lesser and lesser. So as the market has been trying to push higher into the end of March, you saw less and less stocks making new 52-week highs. And as the market is rolling over, there are some outliers that are still making new 52-week highs, but not many, right? So you have a handful of names making new 52-week highs. Back here in March, we had almost, you know, what, 20, 25% of the S&P 500 members making a new 52-week high all in the same day. Uh, yesterday on Friday's close, it was 13 stocks making new 52-week highs. So a very small percentage, right? I mean, single-digit percentages of the S&P making new highs. So an evaporation in new 52-week highs is pretty common at a market top. And that lack of new 52-week highs is what uh, prevents the markets, broadly speaking, from showing strength. Now you're looking for red, and more red means stocks are actually selling off. I wouldn't anticipate a lot of red on this chart because so many stocks are so far above their 52-week highs, but a lack of new 52-week highs is really some damning evidence for uh, the major averages here. Here we're looking at the percent of stocks above their key moving averages. As I mentioned, the S&P indeed closed below its 50-day moving average today for the first time since early November, really the first time coming off of that October low that we've seen the market look this week in terms of its uh, proximity and uh, and uh, and directional move away or near its 50-day 50, uh, 50 moving average. You can see at the bottom in green, the percent of S&P stocks remaining above their 50-day moving average. It's down to 37% as of today's close. So most stocks are below their 50-day moving average. Most stocks are still above their 200-day moving average, right? 70%. So what that means is that most stocks kind of look like what the S&P does, right? Where we're now below the 50-day moving average, but we're still well above 
the 200 day. So the 50 day are the percent of stocks above their 50 day moving average now down in the 30 percentages uh, sort of area. Now I immediately start to look to the left and start to think, all right, what would you need to see for this to be contrarian bullish? Meaning it's so negative that all of a sudden it's more optimistic. And what you can see is this indicator often, particularly in severe downdrafts, can get down to single digits. You will actually see down around uh, eight to 10 percent of the S&P members uh, above their 50-day moving average. It rarely gets down to zero because there's always something kind of hanging in there. Uh, but in that case, you know, nine out of 10 S&P stocks remaining above their 50-day, that usually means things are so bombed out, you're probably getting at least a, a bit of a bounce here. And, and the, the concern I have now is now that we're below 50%, there's a lot of room, there's a lot of deterioration that could happen before we get any kind of uh, encouraging sign here. Now, how do we separate a brief market pullback that ends up being fairly viable with a deeper correction where you really want to get out of the way? And for me, one of those indicators would be this middle panel, which is the percent of stocks above their 200-day. If stocks start failing to hold their 200-day, then things are really getting ugly, right? Then things are really deteriorating. We're not just pulling back. We're really starting to see some declines. We're well above that uh, sort of level. We're at a safe distance from that uh, level here. Uh, and so I would say this is a, a chart to watch to see if we get any sort of, you know, bombed out short term breadth and also any sort of confirmation from the long term breadth. For now, it's reading like either a pullback or again, it could be if we continue to see a deterioration, the beginning of something more significant. Now, indicators that tell me this is probably going to be more of a painful drawdown than we've experienced so far, the fact that the bullish percent indexes have gotten so negative. The S&P 500 bullish percent index uh, down around 56% as of today's close. Getting below 70% is, uh, is the sell signal we look for. The most recent sell signal in mid-January did not work particularly well because the market moved higher despite that weakening breadth. But if you look to the left, you can see previous signals actually worked incredibly well. It's one of the best indicators in uh, 2022 into 2023 of a market top. It's starting to look a little more like that with the uh, decline that we've experienced so far just off of that uh, initial signal. The uh, NASDAQ 100's bullish percent index down to 40%. So 40% of the uh, S and uh, the Nasdaq 100 members, that is, are still in a bullish point in figure chart. That means well over half are in a bearish point in figure chart, and that doesn't just happen at a top. That happens after decline is really starting to uh, to play out here. So I would say these are pretty bearish numbers that you're seeing in terms of the uh, the bullish percent indexes. So what do we do with this readings to wrap up the segment uh, banking on breadth? So I would say, you know, part of this is on the tactical side, right? Do you see signs of a market top on the tactical time frame, on the short term time frame? Besides the fact that our market trend model has turned negative, I would say the fact that the McClellan oscillator is well below zero, the fact that uh, new highs have evaporated, the fact that the... Uh, percent of stocks above their 50 days below 50 percent those are all classic short-term sell signals telling you that whatever just happened whatever peak we're coming off of is probably a pretty significant peak now the challenge is what we're looking for is more of a protracted decline like you saw in august september october november of last year which is more of a significant drawdown than we've experienced so far so what you want to start to do is look back on the chart and say all right when we had a, more of a broad decline that lasted not weeks but months what kind of things happened? And to be clear, uh, I would say, uh, number one, you didn't have a lot of new highs, right? If you look back at August, September, October uh, of last year, you had very few new 52-week highs, although it's worth noting, you did still have a handful, even in the worst moments of that market, you still had some stocks that were kind of bouncing and, uh, and doing just fine. But for the most part, you had a lot of new 52-week lows. So we had a lot of red on this chart. That's what you would start to see. Very few uh, green bars and a lot of red bars, which would tell you a lot of stocks are really breaking down and continuing to make new 52-week lows. An expansion in new 52-week lows is pretty common in a uh, in a bearish phase. So, you know, I, I think the way this chart evolves, I would look back to August, September of last year and see if we get a similar sort of reading with not a lot of green and a lot more red. That would be a sign uh, for concern. The broader and I would say more longer term uh, signals would be, um, you know, over 50 percent of stocks breaking below their 200 day moving average. These advanced decline lines that we saw back here breaking down even further, getting below their 50 day moving average, the 50 day moving average may be sloping lower, which is what you actually saw in September of last year, which is one of the things telling you, OK, this isn't over yet. Right. We have a lot more further uh, to go. And then you can start looking for a bottom. But I think at this point, it's way premature to be looking for a bottom in this market. I think it's more confirming the fact that we're in a pullback. And, you know, the breadth analysis I'm looking at here and that we described tells me we're, you know, we may still be in the early days here. 
That's it for Banking on Breath. We got to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. In our Banking on Breath segment, we talked about a number of different breadth indicators, which is what I love about market breadth. It's a pretty important part of my toolkit because I've learned that just analyzing the S&P or the NASDAQ on its own, you're missing a lot more depth in terms of the stocks that comprise those indexes. And I think there's a lot to be gained from looking at some individual stocks. That's why we look at the Magnificent Seven and Friends or whatever we're going to call that group. Uh, we can also look at breadth indicators, which summarize the conditions of hundreds, if not thousands of stocks in one data series. And when I'm looking at something like the percent of stocks above their key moving averages, the fact that we've gotten down to this point with only 37% of S&P members remaining above their 50-day moving average, that tells me we're in a full-on pullback. It tells me on the tactical time frame, I want to be waiting uh, and uh, and at the very least sitting on my, on my hands to see what uh, happens uh, at most, maybe starting to get a little more defensive, maybe think about some tactical uh, short positions or uh, inverse ETFs to play. Uh, to be, uh, play on a, a short-term uh, downdraft. And then as this uh, pullback may mature even further, uh, then you start to look for uh, bottoming signs. But I would say the breadth conditions are not giving me anything about bottoming. They are more in the early stages of a decline at this particular moment. Chart number two, but we didn't in our market recap get into interest rates, but I would say given what's happened uh, over the last week, given the uncertainty uh, with the geopolitical situation, which it feels like there was gasoline thrown on that fire uh, over the weekend, uh, you know, very much a risk of a broader uh, conflict in the Middle East. And again, no no guarantees and no geopolitical commentary, but just there's an elevated risk. And I think the charts are really starting to uh, reflect that. One of the ways you see that is with rates going higher. Uh, not just in terms of the uh, the conditions in the in the Middle East, but also because of the uh, overheated inflation data that we got at the end of last week. That sort of data point is the biggest risk to this glide path that we've talked about, right? The market, and we've talked about a number of my guests, the market is pricing in a particular uh, set of scenarios playing out for the Fed uh, with a couple uh, rate drops, uh, rate cuts in 2024, a couple more in 2025. Those start at the June meeting, and I would say any overheated economic data could put that glide path into question, and that's what we experienced on Friday. That's what drove that sell-off, and today you're seeing rates push higher, which is really the market pricing in uh, you know, at least a delay in rate cuts or at least maybe the an elevated risk of the Fed having to adjust their um, sort of well-telegraphed uh, game plan for rate cuts in 2024. Keep an eye on rates, which appear to be going higher. Finally, if I haven't given you enough things to uh, keep an eye on, keep your eye on the VIX, right? The VIX over 20 for years has been my back of the envelope signal uh, separating a low volatility environment, which we've been in pretty, pretty much consistently since uh, the first quarter of 2023, and a high uh, um, uh, high uncertainty or a high uh, volatility environment, which tells you that investors are getting nervous. There's uncertainty that is elevated. There's volatility. There's noise in the market that's elevated. That usually is not coinciding with a market rally. That usually coincides more with markets in distribution. So a VIX over 20 getting closer and closer by the day here. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Thanks for hanging with us as I do this one from home. Hopefully uh, heal and get better and back in the studio very soon. For Stock Charts and Rub in Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.